Thank you very much. So I was asked to give a lecture about the Monte Carlo simulation of a matrix model in the context of a holography. So I have three lectures. So I would start with motivation and uh, explain what the hell is the Markov chain Monte Carlo. When I give lecture to string theorists, typically, you know, many of the string theorists have uh, never worked in Markov chain Monte Carlo. Maybe, you know, they learned it in college when they are 18, but after that, for 20, 30 years, they never uh, use Markov chain Monte Carlo. So I think just giving a brief overview, spending an hour, is very instructive. So for lattice practitioners, it's just a boring part. You can fall asleep. I think you had a nice meal, so it's time to sleep. And uh, probably tomorrow, I spent one, uh, an hour for how to define super mills using uh, you know, lattice or some other method. This part can have uh, overlap with Simon Cattero's talk. And then on the third talk, I will uh, explain actual application to gauge gravity duality with some actual numbers and the plots. And uh, motivation is very simple. So we want to use gauge gravity duality to learn about string theory, M theory. And for that purpose, we should solve the uh, supaya mirror theory which can be regarded as non perturbative formulation of the string M theory. And we want to solve it. And the problem is how we can solve it. And it's very, of course, it's very simple. In principle, we should just define theory and then diagonalize Hamiltonian or perform path integral. And, uh, you know, physicists are spending more than 100 years just trying to diagonalize Hamiltonian, and it's very tough. Uh, task. So I, we have to think how, in practice, we can do, you know, such calculation. And uh, so, our uh, the approach I try to explain, uh, spending three uh, talks, is uh, you know application of numerical method like lattice QCD simulation. So I give uh, some explicit numerical tool to perform path integral. And uh, the motivation. Uh, let me uh, introduce one problem which we want to solve. Th of course, there can be many other interesting applications, but this is uh, you know, one of the goals, or first goal. And this is a numerical solution of the uh, so-called three-quarter problem. And the three-quarter problem is uh, this. So let's consider four-dimensional super mills at finite temperature. And if gauge gravity duality conjecture is correct, then this theory should be dual to string theory. And at large n, strong coupling, strong coupling in gauge theory side, this lambda is a g mu squared times n of coupling. We can, uh, if the duality is correct, we can uh, use weakly coupled gravity uh, to uh, calculate properties of the system, for example, the energy as a function of the temperature. And the weak coupling regime, we can use perturbative, perturbative method. And if we calculate uh, energy as a function of the temperature and the n, at, uh, at weak coupling and big enough n, then we get some calculable constant c times n squared times t to the fourth. If you look at some uh, differences from late 90s, you can see the you know, actual value for this c. It's calculable. And the t to the force, you know, this power is very easy. It's just a power count. Uh, you know, it's conformal theory. So from dimensional counting, you can get this power t to the force. And the n squared is just a tofu counting. And if you do, so non trivial part is this c. And if you do the same calculation using real gravity picture, then you get the exact same thing times three quarters. And if you, uh, calculate the uh, you know, perturbative correction in weakly coupling side, we can see it goes slightly down. And the string theory side, finite coupling correction can be uh, estimated by using uh, alpha prime expansion in string theory. And it goes up a little bit. So they are coming closer, so probably it's okay. That's what people say in the 90s. But we don't really know if they are actually connected. And, uh, oh, sorry. I skip this, but so this alpha prime lambda expansion tells us it goes down, alpha prime expansion tells it goes up. But, uh, you know, 
from gauge theory point of view, we did honest gauge theory calculation only here. And here, there is no gauge theory calculation. First of all, why do we believe this uh, dual gravity prescription is correct? There is no proof. And we don't really, even if it's true, we don't really know how if they are actually connected. So we want to derive this part from super-MU theory. This is a three-quarter problem. And uh, it, so here I used a well-known example of ADS5 CFT4 correspondence, but a similar problem exists for other cases as well. For example, right after Mandelsner's first paper about gauge gravity duality, uh, three people from uh, Tel Aviv plus Mandelsner uh, wrote a very nice paper about more generic version of gauge gravity duality. And they claim that P plus one dimensional UN super mills. Here P is a spatial dimension, and it can be zero, one, two, or three. Such gauge theory should be equivalent to type two way or type two B string around the black P brain background. Here, black P brain means P is a spatial extension. So black zero brain is just a black hole. In a black hole, it looks like a point seen from far away. So it's a zero dimensional object approximately. And the black one brain is a black string. So it has one dimensional spatial extension. Black two brain is like main brain. Black three brain has a you know, three dimensional extension. And the P equal to three case, black three brain background is actually equivalent to ADS5 cross S5. So this is a more gen general, generic version of uh, AD, original ADS5 CFT4 correspondence. And uh, if whether we can solve it numerically and derive the property of this one, and especially if we can uh, connect weakly coupled region of gauge theory and the strongly coupled region of gauge theory where super gravity is a good description, it's a you know a generalized version of the three quarter problem. And numerically, you know, apparently p equals to zero is the easiest case. So later in this uh, uh, talk, I will explain how we can you know, solve the three-quarter problem in the case of the zero blame. But first, let me just show you the result. Okay? And I will be spending uh, three uh, slots. I will explain how to get that result. But let me first show the result. So gauge theory, in this case, is uh, you know, zero plus one dimensional super mills. So there is no space, so it's just uh, quantum mechanics. It's not even quantum field theory. And the Lagrangian is given by this, and you don't have to understand the detail at this moment. But simply, we have nine n by n matrices, bosonic matrices and 16 n by n fermionic matrices. And formally, this is a dimensional reduction of 40 n equals to four super mills or equivalently dimensional reduction of 10-dimensional n equals to 1 super mills to 0 plus 1 dimension. And according to the duality conjecture, this should be the other type 2A black zero brain if we take, uh, go close to the Tofuft limit. Here, to, by Tofuft limit, I mean Tofuft coupling lambda, which is uh, g m mu square times n, is fixed, and n is sent to infinity. But in this uh, zero plus one dimensional theory, actually this coupling constant has uh, mass dimension three. So if you know QCD well, uh, you know, lambda QCD set the scale of the theory. In a similar manner, this uh, dimension full coupling constant set the scale of the theory. So all the dimension full quantity should be measured in the unit of this. But in other words, we can make a dimensionless combination. This is lambda to the minus one third times temperature is dimensionless. Or lambda to the minus one third times energy, this is also dimensionless. And uh, we can imagine, you know, we just set lambda equals to one. Or equivalently, we just consider this dimensionless combination. And uh, for example, when we take two foot limit, we fix this dimensionless combination to be n to the zero and send n to infinity. Then energy scales like n square. And if you want to calculate the two-point function, for example, we should uh, fix the distance scale in the unit of this coupling to the n to the zero and take large n limit. That's the foot limit. Okay. And if we take the foot limit, okay, so if we you know scale the lambda and the t in this manner, then so energy of the system, energy of the matrix model 
should be identified to black hole mass, according to the Duarte Dictionary. And we can calculate you know, both uh, uh, those quantities in gravity side and the matrix model side. And here, in order to make the sim notation simple, so I, by temperature or energy, I actually mean this dimensionless combination. And the secret I'm setting lambda equals to one. And because the uh, you know, coupling constant has a non trivial mass dimension, simple uh, dimensional counting doesn't work. And we, from the uh, gravity side, we can determine this very strange expansion. So this leading part is uh, supergravity. Okay, 7.41. It's actually, this is 7.41, da, 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 something. But this is analytically calculable number, okay, from uh, dual geometry. And uh, this constant times t to the, this very strange power, 14 over 5. This is supergravity prediction. And we know that uh, higher, uh, when we take large energy limit, the higher temperature, uh, part is a string alpha prime correction. And uh, this is alpha prime cube correction. This is alpha prime to the fifth correction. And though we don't know, you know the coefficient here, we know the power from uh, knowledge of the uh, string theory. And uh, so this is a plot of, <laughs> this is a, for, uh, you know, what we expect for energy divided by n square as a function of temperature. And here, energy and the Temperature is dimensionless, okay? And the uh, important thing here is uh, strong coupling and low temperature are the same thing in the sense this dimensionless combination becomes small. Okay? If you fix T and send lambda to be large, then this combination becomes small. Or in other words, if you fix lambda and make T small, of course, this combination becomes small. So strong coupling and low temperature are the same notion. And weak coupling and high temperature are the same notion. And so at low temperature region, we expect this supergravity result to be good. Okay. And uh, you know, here I uh, wrote down this expansion, but these are you know, higher power with respect to T. So at low temperature, they are not important. And at high temperature region, if, if we go to the high temperature region, then eventually, you know, such corrections should turn on, set in, and then we should end up in some uh, perturbative result in yami uh, gauge theory side. And in this case, uh, uh, we can easily calculate that uh, high at high temperature, this uh, combination should scale like six times temperature. And so we want to connect this high temperature behavior and this uh, low temperature behavior by actually solving the theory in any parameter region. This is a D0 rain version of a three quarter problem. And there are long history for this. We are spending almost 10 years to solve this problem. And in 2007, uh, uh, so uh, I and Nishimura uh, Takeuchi wrote this paper. So this is energy versus temperature. And this is supergravity. And this is weak coupling result. And this dotted line is a weak coupling plus uh, next to leading order in lambda expansion. And then at high temperature region, uh, so weak coupling result and simulation result are reasonably, agree reasonably well. And gradually, we see some deviation and go close to this uh, supergravity result. And uh, this is a similar calculation by uh, Cattrall and Weisman. And in their case, they plotted the energy divided by temperature. And uh, uh, here, you, you may think here it's a bit messy, but actually, in, if you read this pa their paper, they say these points are not really trustable, and you should just look at this point. And then you can actually see that uh, simulation result go close to supergravity curve very nicely. And so we got a quantitatively good result. And uh, there are many papers uh, about, you know, there are many improvements for this result. But in uh, uh, one, in 2016, in summer, uh, Monte Carlo string M theory collaboration. So this is, uh, you know, I'm a part of this collaboration. But for example, Evan Bakovic here, or Enrico Rinaldi, who is not in this room, are, did very good, made a very big contribution to this work. And we try to see this uh, low temperature region more carefully. And in previous work, uh, we didn't take large N and continuum, but uh, 
you know, we, we, or I would say Evan and Enrico. I'm saying we, but uh, you know, Enrico and Evan did all the hard work for this paper. And uh, they uh, actually took large and, and continuum limit. And this is a supergravity result. And uh, these curves are, you know, fit for previous results. You don't have to uh, care at this moment. And we can actually see that simulation result go very close to this supergravity curve. And we can fit it by using uh, uh, t to the 2.8 times 7.4. This is the number we want. And we, by this, uh, we knew that, sorry, it's a bit messy, but this was a prediction, right? And uh, in that slide, we try to fit energy by letting this coefficient, this coefficient, this coefficient to be fitting parameter. And we fixed power by hand. And we also try to derive uh, power in uh, some different fitting on that. But anyways, in this case, so we did three parameter fit, and we could get 7.4 with a very good precision. And also, uh, by choosing a, a coefficient of a alpha prime correction carefully, uh, we can actually fit a simulation result perfectly. So in this sense, uh, it seems that so, uh, we can actually solve three-quarter problem by using a numerical simulation. And I want to explain how we can actually do such simulation and how we can get such result and how we might be able to attack other theories as well, like four-dimensional super mills. So first I have to explain how to perform Euclidean path integral by using Markov chain Monte Carlo. So for example, from now, Evan can fall asleep because <laughs> he knows everything about it. And uh, before ex explaining uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, we should understand why we need it. We, uh, why do we need it? Why, why don't we use some other much simpler method? And for that, we should uh, just take, you know, show, I can just show one-way ticket to disaster if we use a very naive method. Imagine we have a p variable function, and we want to integrate it. And uh, so typically, if you look at the textbook of analysis in a college, we say, they say, OK, so first, we can uh, approximate the integral by sum. So in each direction, we take small beans and just uh, you know, add the area or volume of these beans. And if we you know, say, make the bean finer and finer, the result converges to the right value. This is how we define Dima integral. And uh, of course, we can use it for actual uh, calculation. But uh, imagine we have uh, 10 variables, and imagine we had 100 bin for each direction. Then we would have 10 to the 20 bins, and we have to sum up you know, this many number. And if we have 50 numbers, we have to sum up the, you know, this many numbers. And if we use a river model of Sequoia, which used, a few years ago, it was a top in uh, top 500. And this was the fastest supercomputer in the world. And suppose we use it to sum uh, you know, these numbers. And of course, it, in actual calculation, we need several uh, uh, you know, operations to evaluate the value at each point. And uh, you know, we, so, so actually, we need more than this many operations, but suppose we just need this many operation. Then in order to do 10 to the 20 operations by using Sequoia, it takes uh, 5,000 seconds. It's still acceptable. But uh, 10 to, for 10 to the 13 operations, it takes uh, this long. Actually, uh, this is longer than history of the Homo sapiens. And because we are in India, I uh, try to see how much it takes where if we have 70 variables. Then actually, after, before we finish these operations, uh, this uh, uh, mitre mitre shows up and uh, solves uh, you know all problems in the world. <laughs> okay, so I, I think this is the biggest number Indian people could imagine, but uh, the, such a big number is not even enough for 70 variable integral. So I would say this is one way to get to disaster. And. And uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo solved this problem uh, by using the notion of important sampling. So imagine we are trying to do path integral of uh, some physical system. 
then you know, this f is actually exponential of minus action. And you can imagine you know, this action is like a potential. So we have a huge phase space. And you can imagine in this map of Grand Canyon, you can imagine altitude of this x. And uh, we, unless uh, we take uh, x1 to xp to be very close to the bottom of the potential, this exponential minus s is uh, vanishingly small. So in this map, only around here, actually, only this region are actually important for the integral. And for example, this region, this region, this region, they don't really contribute to the integral. So we shouldn't waste uh, resource to evaluate such unimportant configurations. And we should pick up only important beans, which contribute to the actual integral significantly. This is the idea of important sampling. And Monte Carlo actually does it. And this is a picture of Monte Carlo from Monarch, I think. And this is a picture of von Neumann, who came up with the idea of using random number to do such integral. And let's consider field theory on Euclidean space-time with the action S of phi. And uh, I will explain how we can, uh, we can do this, but the basic idea is, OK, by choosing some clever algorithm, we generate field configuration with probability exponential minus s. OK, so when this x value is small, we generate such configuration a lot. When uh, this value is small, we don't want to generate such configuration. And if we can generate uh, a lot of configurations with this probability weight, then this path you know, this is the definition of a web of a certain operator O. And this is actually approximated by ensemble average. And when this n number of sample goes to infinity, then it, it, here we have exact equality. And here I say the, you know, we generate configuration with this probability. So important assumption here is that uh, this probability has to be real and positive. In some situation, this can become negative or complex value. Then we cannot actually use Markov chain Monte Carlo. This is a so-called sign problem, which I will mention later. But uh, for the moment, suppose you know, this condition is satisfied. And the basic idea is generate a chain of field configurations. So here I just wrote phi, but let's call the use C to, be, to denote the configuration of uh, you know, fields. So if, for example, if we use lattice regularization, then we have a value of phi at each lattice point. And by using C, I denote set of all those variables. But if you use momentum cutoff, we have a Fourier mode, you know, phi to the zero, phi to the one, phi to the two. And by using C, we denote set of all such Fourier mode. And starting with some uh, initial configuration, we changed configuration little by little. And we define some uh, transition probability from uh, one configuration to the other. And we design uh, this chain to be Markov chain, which means transition probability from CK to CK plus one does not depend on uh, previous history. And by de designing such Markov chain appropriately, we can make our probability of uh, obtaining a specific concrete configuration of C at kth step to be proportional to exponential minus S. And the uh, algorithm, there can be many algorithms. We simply say Markov chain Monte Carlo, but there are many various versions. But the algorithm is basically a choice of this transition probability. And the is the same simplest algorithm. And I will explain this today. And uh, in a that is gauge theory simulation, we use typically use hybrid Monte Carlo or rational hybrid Monte Carlo, which are typically useful when we have a fermion in the system. But the basic idea is the same. And uh, it appears in a famous paper, uh, uh, Metropolis, Rosen, Blues, Rosen, Blues, Teller, Teller. But uh, somehow, only his name is going to this algorithm. I don't know why. Anyways, 
we design the transition probability so that these conditions are satisfied. Markov chain, irreducibility, periodicity, and the detailed balance. And I already said Markov chain means the transition probability from k configuration to k plus first configuration does not depend on previous history. So for example, as, let's imagine, for, as a simplest example, let's consider one variable integral. Then configuration CK just means the value of the integration variable. And uh, so from XK, we want to get XK plus one. And imagine you, we just add a small random number. And if we take this small random number to be between minus one and one, it's perfectly fine. And here by random number, I mean, uh, you, you know, uh, this random number does not care. I'm assuming this random number generator does not uh, refer to previous history. But for example, if we take delta x to be within this range, then it explicitly refers to previous history, so it's not Markov chain. And you can imagine that if uh, xk minus 1 is 0 by coincidence, then after that it's never updated, so it's obvious that uh, in such case, we cannot actually get the right distribution. And the irreducibility means any two configurations are connected by finitely many steps. So imagine we have uh, two integration regions, which are separated by distance L. And if this random change here is smaller than L, then if you start for, with the configuration here, you can never reach here. So it does not satisfy irreducibility condition. But if uh, C is bigger than L, then from here, you sometimes, occasionally you can jump. So irreducibility condition is satisfied. Uh, or if we just take a delta X to be Gaussian random number, then you know, arbitrary big value, large value can be obtained, though a probability is small. So still you have finite uh, probability of transition from here to here. So reducibility condition is satisfied. And it's ob you know, the necessity of this uh, condition sh should be obvious because you know, in this case, for example, we can never sample this configuration, so we never get right distribution. And aperiodicity means uh, uh, a bit uh, slightly complicated thing. So first we have to define period of configuration C. So imagine from uh, some configuration C, you, you, you change configuration randomly, and uh, after a while, it can come back to the original configuration. Okay, And the period of C means greatest common divisor of possible number of steps from C to itself. And a periodic means period equals to one for any configuration. And uh, in this example, for example, if we just take, you know, randomly change x, then, you know, delta x can be one. In delta x, can, no, sorry, delta x can be zero. So actually, you know, it's in principle possible to come back just after one step. So greatest common divisor is one, it's fine. But uh, for example, if we take design uh, transition probability to be such to such that xk is positive for even k, negative for odd k. Then period is even, so it does not satisfy a periodicity. And for example, if you, you design a, a, a random change so that xk is x, xk plus one is xk times some negative random number, then you know such strange condition is satisfied. So it's not a, a periodic. And the detailed balance condition is. Uh, the most non trivial thing, I think. And here you defer to the actual detail of the action. So you take transition probability from C to C prime times this weight you want to get equals to transition probability from C, plus C prime to C times this weight. You should design a transition probability in this manner. And uh, the reason why this is uh, necessary and sufficient is a bit hard to explain, but uh, that, that it looks uh, reasonable can be understood rather easily. Okay? Because 
if we have some uh, stationary distribution after a long time, then after one step, stationary distribution should stay in stationary distribution, okay? And imagine, you know, PC was a stationary distribution. Then if you multiply some transition probability from C to C prime and sum over C, then you should get stationary distribution. But now, you know, uh, argument changes to C prime. And if we have detailed balance condition, uh, uh, this P stationary distribution PC is proportional to exponential minus S because uh, 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 it, it's actually, it, this is actually the solution to this equation because uh, this is, so here I just uh, replaced this P of C to the exponential minus C. And because of detailed balance condition, we, I, we can uh, switch, uh, exchange C prime and C. So here, S of C became S of C prime. P of C to C prime become P of C to C prime. But here then, this sum of C does not care about this part. So you can, take, we can I can just, we can just move this exponential minus C prime out of the sum. But then this is a probability of C prime to go some other C. And this, if we just sum over all possibilities, it's just one. So we get this. So this is actually a solution to this stationary uh, distribution condition. And uh, so if we design a, a Markov chain such that these four conditions are satisfied, uh, there's a mathematical theorem, theorem that uh, you know, uh, after a long time we reach it, uh, good, uh, right uh, probability distribution we want in the theorem, and I want to explain, you know, how uh, it can be used to do Gaussian integral. And of course, you know, we can do Gaussian integral analytically. But, uh, you know, I, I know it's uh, something like square root pi, but uh, I'm not really sure if it's square root pi or square root pi divided pi 2, and uh, every time I have to look at Wikipedia. So, you know, it's good to know that how we can actually derive the number. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, so Metropolis algorithm invented by these people. Uh, I already explained the you know, Metropolis algorithm in an abstract manner, but uh, I want to explain how this algorithm can actually be used for Gaussian integral. Okay, and uh, okay, so this is the action. We have only one variable here. And you know, eventually we want to do path integral, but the path integral is just a much variable integral. So all that sense is here. And the partition function, is just the integral of exponential minus s, okay? And the integration region for, is from minus infinity to plus infinity. So first, we choose an you know, initial condition, whatever you want, and vary the field x randomly, okay? And here, let me ch uh, choose this random change to be uniform random number between minus one half and plus one half. And then accept this new configuration with this probability, where delta s is change of the action. Uh, so if uh, delta x, delta s is negative, minimum of one and exponential minus delta s is just one. Okay, so if delta s is negative or if action decreases, we always accept this new configuration. And in case, this is positive, we accept new configuration only with this probability. And uh, otherwise, we just uh, keep the previous configuration. And, uh, and in order to see uh, you know, all those config, we can easily see all these four conditions are satisfied. But here, non-trivial thing is detailed balance. So let me concentrate on detailed balance condition. Okay, so delta s is s of x prime minus s x. But uh, we can just take it to be positive without loss of generality, okay? And uh, the probability of uh, x goes to x prime is zero if x minus x prime is uh, bigger than 0 0.5, because we restrict delta x to be in this range. And otherwise, uh, it's proportional to exponential minus delta s. 
And the probability of x prime goes to x is, again, 0 if uh, you know, this difference is bigger than 0 0.5. And uh, 1 otherwise. Because here we assume delta s is 0. And the transition probability in this case is a minimum of 1 and exponential plus ds, uh, which is uh, just 1. And then uh, exponential minus sx times uh, p transition probability from x to x prime is uh, exponential minus s times exponential minus delta s when you know x minus x prime is smaller than 0 0.5. And uh, but by definition, because of this definition, this is exponential minus s x prime. And this is proportional to exponential of s of x prime because this is just one. So detailed balance condition is satisfied. And if we start with x equal to zero and use this algorithm, then x changes in this manner. And if we uh, make the histogram of the uh, distribution of value of x, then with 100 sample, we get this distribution, which is slightly far from the uh, actual Gaussian distribution. But if you have 1,000 or more samples, you can see distribution actually converges to Gaussian distribution. And the same holds for more complicated function or a higher dimension. And this is why we can use uh, you know, this algorithm to perform this integral for generic uh, action. And if we plot x squared as a function of uh, Monte Carlo time, then we get something like this. And this is actually an average value which is 1. And we can actually see that if we take average of x square from 0 to 1, or 0 to 2, or 0 to 1,000, if we average, take average of the first uh, you know, 1,000 or 10,000 samples as a function of the you know, number of samples, it changes this manner. So it gradually converges to 1. And we can also take an uh, average of x, and we can see that it com uh, actually we need more samples to actually have convergence, but it converges to zero. Excellent. And uh, there we started with x equals to zero, but if we start x equals to, and of course we know that x equals to 10 is too big, and actually it does not contribute to integral. And what we see is actually value of x you know, quickly come close to important value around zero and start to oscillate around zero. Uh, if you use the language of physics, it's a kind of quick thermalization to thermalize state. And in practice, we can just, uh, you know, remove such con configuration and only use this configuration to calculate the expectation value because, you know, these are the important samples. And uh, this is a program for performing Gaussian integral. So here I set x, initial value x equals to zero. N accept is the integer which count how many times actually uh, update is accepted. And this is the main part. Okay, so I just uh, save value of x to backup x and calculate the initial action. And here I just generate Gaussian random number between uh, uh, 0 0.5 and uh, minus 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, and just shift x and calculate action after shifted value. And then comp here uh, I calculate, uh, so this action init minus action fin is minus delta s, okay? And I generate random number, which is called metropolis, uh, between 0 and 1. And if this is bigger than this random number, uh, I just accept the configuration, a new configuration. Otherwise, it's rejected and x is uh, set to the previous value. It remains unchanged. And in uh, hybrid Monte Carlo or rational hybrid Monte Carlo, what people do is just improve this part. This uh, basic structure never changes. So if you understand this program, uh, you can uh, understand the basic of uh, lattice QCD simulation. Of course, there are many uh, technical parts, but this is a very basic part. And uh, we know that it can work, but uh, it's always instructive 
instructive to see bad example, which does not actually work. So imagine we shift x to x plus dx, but uh, we choose dx to be uniform random number between minus one half and the plus one half. Then uh, what is the problem? Evan. <laughs> yes, so which is broken? I think uh, detailed balance is uh, you know, apparently broken because, you know, as you said, it's not symmetric. So we can go from 0 to 1, but we cannot go from 1 to 0. Then if you go back to the, you know, how we check the detailed balance condition, we can easily see that the detailed balance condition is uh, not satisfied. Necessary? OK, so in this case, or, or, but depending on the algorithm, in Metropolis, for sure, we need detailed balance. Uh -huh. Suppose I only have three states with equal probability. Uh -huh. If you go around like this, it doesn't satisfy detailed balance with a single step Markov process, but it's perfectly ergodic and correct. So I would say, okay, then detailed, so, balance, detailed balance is a sufficient condition. But, yeah, no. but the reason I mention it is that in trying to prove improve hybrid Monte Carlo, mm -hmm. people are looking at things that do not satisfy detailed balance, but are in fact correct. A hybrid Monte Carlo, but uh, in many of the many of implementations, present, the hybrid... present algorithms use detailed balance, but is, it is a myth that you have to use it. And therefore, if you want to improve it, uh -huh. you might want to break that. Uh, OK, OK, by breaking it, but... But still, it be a correct Markov process. Mm -hmm. But in this case, because of this, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's wrong for another reason, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so what is broken here? <laughs> Just bad. But anyways, what I can say is if you satisfy these four conditions, you are safe. Mm, efficient, OK. And in this case, uh, so you can easily imagine this is a correct original, uh, you know, correct Gaussian distribution. But because you know we have a bias to set push x to larger value, actually the distribution we get shift to the bigger value. And in order to improve this uh, efficiency, of course, uh, the best improvement is that of course we can do analytic calculation in this case. <laughs> but still, uh, let, let's see how we can improve this uh, stupid integral. And then uh, we can uh, get a rough idea about how you know, we can tune the parameters in more complicated cases. And the important notion here is uh, autocorrelation. So here we change x little by little. So if we start with x equals to 10, for a while x remains in big value. So value of x has some correlation. They are not all independent. And uh, in this simulation, we had only one parameter, which is a step size. And we choose c equals to, equals to be one half. But there was no reason that we had to choose that value. By just keeping c to be a uh, arbitrary positive number, we, can, we could satisfy all those four conditions. And if c is too small, then delta s is almost 0. So accept almost 100% acceptance rate is achieved. So in that sense, it's very efficient. But at the same time, it's almost a random walk with a small number of steps. We are not really using the you know, detail of the action, explicit uh, information from the action. So it makes uh, such choice very inefficient. And if we take C to be too large, then very often de delta S is very big. So such change is rarely accepted. In that sense, it's very inefficient. But once it's accepted, of course, you, you, know, you can uh, uh, achieve a big change. And here I said DX is almost one. Because if DX, so it, even when C is 100, you know, occasionally, Uniform distribution, you know, so we just choose dx to be uniform distribution between here. So if c is 100, 
we have a 1% probability that the dx is close to 1, then such change is accepted. Otherwise, if c is close to 100, it's almost never accepted. So acceptance rate is you know, roughly 1 over c. And once it's accepted, change is order 1. But anyway, because uh, you know, dx doesn't depend on c, but the acceptance rate goes down with c, it's very inefficient. And uh, I say the co uh, configurations are correlated, and they are not really independent. And in order to achieve good precision, we should collect a lot of independent samples. And we should tune this parameter C so that we can collect as many uh, independent configurations as possible with a fixed amount of uh, resource. And uh, when change, you know, random change is accepted, we know that when C is C is large, then once it's accepted, it changes over the one. So we can roughly say, once it's accepted, the new configuration is almost independent from the previous one. So in the sense, you know, this n, which is needed for two uh, configuration to become independent, is one when C is large. But when C is small, it's almost random walk. So in order to in, you know, go this uh, configuration, distance one far away from this, we need uh, c times square root n, which is a typical uh, distance between these configurations to become one. So the number of configuration we need is something like one over c square. And uh, we also have to care about the acceptance rate. Then uh, in order to achieve uh, order one change, we can show that when c is large, we need order c steps. When c is small, we need one over c square steps to get one independent sample. So we should uh, find uh, some sweet spot between large c region and small c region. And if you, you know, uh, try several different values of c, you can see that the c definitely around the four is more efficient. So here I plotted the uh, average of x squared as a number of configurations I collected. And c equals to 0 0.5, 2.0, 4.0, 0. Point, this is correct value 1. And 0 0.5 is not really close to 1, even with this many sample. But you know, c equals to 2 or 4 roughly it, after 6, uh, 60,000 steps, it, it's more or less correct. And you can also see that if C is too big, then you know, convergence is again very slow. Anyways, we learned how to calculate the web x, x squared. But firstly, I was talking about the uh, integral itself, or partition function. So how can we calculate a partition function? And in, for example, in QCD, we, very often we don't really need a partition function. We just need waves. But uh, in string theory application, sometimes we want a partition function. So we want to do this integral. And suppose we know uh, some other action is 0, and the partition function obtained from that. And suppose we know this partition function analytically. For example, in the case of Gaussian integral, we can uh, you know, calculate partition function explicitly. Then, by using this, uh, the method I have explained, we can actually calculate the ratio z over z0 in this manner. So here, uh, integral of exponential minus s is actually, exponential minus s is a product of exponential minus s0 times exponential is 0 minus s, because they cancel by definition. And this is actually web of this combination with this weight. And in principle, we can calculate it by using Monte Carlo. And if we know z0 uh, as input, analytically or maybe with some other numerical method, then we can calculate z. And however, uh, there is a so-called overlap problem, and uh, which means in order for Markov chain Monte Carlo to work, we have to pick up important samples. 
but the important sample for S0 and S may be different. For example, uh, let's, let's uh, denote x minus c square over 2 by x, uh, s of x, c. Then suppose we wanted to calculate s of x, 100, which is picked here. And suppose analytically we could solve s, you know, uh, function function for s naught. Of, of course, in, in this case, we can calculate both, but uh, let's consider this case as a two example. And imagine, very stupidly, we try to evaluate you know, this uh, z by using this method. And then, almost all the samples we sample are from here. But then, this weight appearing here is uh, exponential minus 5,000, which is practically zero. And every once in a while, so every exponential 5,000 times, luckily we can pick up such configuration. And the such configuration has a huge weight. And actually, they are more important than these configurations. But of course, here the idea, clearly the idea of important sampling is not working. So this is so-called overlap problem. And in order to solve it, for example, we can just uh, connect uh, Gaussian integral around 0 and 100 by using other Gaussian integrals. So define sk to be x minus k squared over 2. And then x1 and x2 has huge overlap. x2 and x3 has big overlap, and so on. So we can calculate zk plus 1 divided by zk by using Monte Carlo. And uh, if we solve this for all k from 0 to 100, then we can just, uh, you know, by taking product, we can derive z, z of 100. This is how sometimes we can avoid the overall problem. And this stupid idea is already good enough for some string theory application. And actually, we used this stupid method for ABGM matrix model. And what we wanted to do is uh, perform some integral, which is equivalent to partial function of so-called ABGM theory on three sphere. And uh, such, uh, such integral is uh, derived by using so-called supersymmetric localization method. And uh, there's a nice paper by Kapstein, Willett, and Yakov. And there are many beautiful analytic results. But in some parameter region, analytic calculation is uh, very hard. So numerical input can be very useful. And the ABJ matrix model is just this integral. So this n and k are size of gauge group and coupling constant of the theory. And uh, k is originally integer, but the integral itself is well defined for any real k. And uh, this non coefficient times this integral correspond to partition function of uh, ABGM theory at finite n, finite coupling. And if we can uh, derive, if we can perform this integral, we can run uh, some uh, various uh, variable information about ABGM theory, which described M2 brain. So we wanted to do this integral, and uh, luckily, you know, this is a tangent hyperbolic square divided by cosine hyperbolic. There is no sign problem. And we just had to perform n variable integral. And what we did was, uh, so, we patch, so we just uh, used this g. So z, g of n0 is uh, analytically calculable. And we just calculated g of n k2 divided by g of n k1 for various uh, values of k1 and k2. And just combined all the results. And then, for example, this is n equals to two case for uh, the function of the various value of coupling constant k. And in this uh, n equals to two case, we had the exact result. And uh, we can see that the numerical value and the exact result agree very well. And we did similar calculation for various value of n and k, and uh, fitted the result as a function of n and k. And uh, you know, this integral is simple enough, so we can achieve really good precision, and we could run many things about the uh, instant effect, for example. And, uh, 
related to all other problem, there's a so-called sign problem. And so far, we assume that the action is real, so that the exponential minus s is real and positive. But what if the action is complex? So s is, if s has imaginary part, then the weight is now complex, so it's not probability anymore. So we cannot use uh, you know, this uh, method directly. And uh, for example, in ABJ matrix model, we can uh, have uh, slightly different variables, use slightly different variables. And now we have some positive quantity times complex phase factor. And then we cannot directly apply uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo to this case. And in the case of ABJ matrix model, we knew, you know, clever change of variable so that this integral becomes a sign-free form. Then we could easily uh, use Monte Carlo. And uh, in the case of uh, finite density QCD, if some genius came up with a good change of variables and the uh, sign problem then disappeared, then we can just use usual Markov chain Monte Carlo. But so far, you know, human hasn't evolved the in, um, very far from uh, apes, I think. We don't really know how to perform such change of variables yet. So we need some uh, practical method. And uh, sometimes so-called reweighting method can work. So this is a definition of, uh, uh, this is a definition of a BEV of a operator, some operator O with this complex action. And formally, this is actually equivalent to this combination, where observable operator times exponential minus is is evaluated by using this action. And maybe I should have uh, added one uh, line here. So this O in a full theory is divided by this. But of course, we can multiply 1 to this value. So some value times 1 is original value. And 1 is actually some value divided by the same value, which is in this case minus SB. And this combination is this part. And this combination is this part. Okay, this is just trivial realignment. And then, if we know, you know, this integral, this can be uh, obtained in, by using numerical method. I have just explained. Then we can uh, estimate, uh, estimate uh, in a value of a full partition function by using uh, this. But the problem is very often this exponential minus i s is very close to zero. So what is the typical value of the action? So it's a, action is typically proportional to system size. So for example, if your system has volume V, this S is of order V. And it's, if it's a Yamio theory, it's N square. So at large N or large volume, it becomes very, very small. And practically within error, it's zero. Then it's just zero divided by zero, whose error is infinite, the dash. So it's very hard to use such method. And with fermion, this same problem often happens. Okay, so now uh, original action is bosonic part plus fermionic part. And uh, typically, fermionic part can be written uh, in a bilinear form by using Dirac operator. And if we integrate that fermion, we get determinant, okay? And the integral variable is just a bosonic one. And this is a path integral weight we want to use. Or equivalently effective action is bosonic part minus log of determinant of Dirac operator. And this is not always real. For example, uh, in the first lecture, uh, the example of uh, finite density QCD was explained. There, this determinant of D is complex. And uh, there is no generic solution to sign problem. But uh, in super mills, actually, it's 
absent, I believe. And in general, actually, determinant is complex. However, we can show that uh, in high temperature region, which is already interesting, sign is almost absent. We can actually measure it, and it's almost vanishing. And if we go to low temperature, uh, phase start to fluctuate. But uh, at least numerically, we can justify that by just omitting complex part and just using a bosonic action. We get the same value. There is no analytic understanding, but we just have numerical evidence. But it seems that phase quenching. By phase quenching, I mean we just forget about this part. Okay, that seems to work. And I will explain later. And uh, I just have nine minutes, and it's a good place to finish, I think. Questions, comments? I think you know this talk was meant for students, and the students are typically hesitate to ask when it's recorded. No, the students so. should ask questions. Yeah, but after. after that. <laughs> yeah. And you talk about the. Yeah, it's one assumption. Uh, K. Uh, here. Uh, yeah, so K should be how much is it should it be? How much it should be? Be separated in general to get the overcome the design, uh, the overlay problem for this specific case. I don't remember precisely, but we took like 0 0.5 or 1. Okay. It's enough. Uh, as a, yeah, at least in a various range of any we studied. Practically, you can see, you know, fluctuation of this combination. If this combination can be very large or very small, it's not really good. And if you know, K is small enough, this is cross to one, then you don't need too many samples. And so what is the value? So exponential, this is order n squared value, I think. So when n is big, you have to take the separation of K1 and K2 to be sufficiently small. So it's really model dependent. I mean, or, there is no such a... Yeah, it's already dependent. n independent. But the, the, uh, if, if you... So you have to calculate the web of this quantity. And if, when you plot you know, that exponential, if it fluctuates like this, it's fine. And you know, if the fluctuation is, say, order one, it's easy to estimate average precisely. However, when n is very large and the k1 and the k2 are not so close, what we typically observe is uh, sometimes we have huge spike. And a small number of spikes can actually dominate integral. Then you know you cannot really do good error estimate. And so you take k1 to k2 close enough so that fluctuation become like that. And uh, in the case of ABGM theory, you know, we can easily avoid the same problem by using this expression. But in ABJ theory, probably you know A theory. And in that case, uh, I don't think there's no uh, sign-free form. So you have to beat sign problem. It's straightforward, but it can be costly. So uh, in the uh, Gaussian integral example which you showed, so suppose if we have multiple variables, uh, uh, this probability distribution can have multiple saddles. And uh, in that uh, situation... Ah, oh, in a much saddle appears. That's a very good question. And uh, sometimes simulation can be trapped in one of the minimum. Yeah, yeah. So and how do you, uh, in, in, that, in those cases, uh, so I have two questions. First is, in those cases, how do you find out what is the optimal value for this size C? And, uh, uh, and, and then how do you uh, escape from one saddle and go to some other saddle? 
I think unless you really know, the, you have a good uh, idea about the location of the saddle, there is no generic solution, I think. And even if uh, you know the location of the saddle, for example, if you have two minimum, and in general, you know, there's a finite transition probability, but if potential height increases, uh, as long as, uh, so for example, if uh, in this potential height becomes too long, unless you jump just by one step, if you try to you know, beat this, uh, if you go across this uh, very uh, big potential, you know, potential barrier, uh, gradual, you know, just going step by step, I don't think you can ever go beyond. And typically, for example, if fluctuation, uh, if in high temperature region, fluctuation is very large and you can easily go across. So typically, you have to go high temperature and gradually cool down. But then there is no generic way to you know, find the minimum. And first of all, if you know such a generic solution, you can uh, make revolution in machine learning, I think. So, <laughs> so it's a very hard problem. But if you know, you know the location, for example, you can. Uh, have uh, occasionally you can uh, randomly jump from here to here. For example, if you want to ha integrate exponential minus half of x squared plus exponential minus a half of uh, x minus 100 squared. Uh, so, so, so if you want to perform an integral of this form, then uh, distribution should be should have two peaks. If you draw the potential, you know, the it potential is like this. And you have to jump from here to here. But you know that one saddle is around zero, one saddle is around 100. So it, you can just, uh, you know, occasionally take the change to be order 100, and then you have finite transition probability, and you can easily get the right answer. But uh, generically, there's no, no solution, I think. Does anybody know practical solution of this problem? Sampling all the minima. This is precisely. This is, of course, the precisely the problem of the instantons, right? Is that you have different sectors. Um, you know, the valleys go down, and then there's a big mountain, and there's another valley, which is yes, yes, probable, yes. but you can't get exactly, to easily. Yeah. Now, sometime there may be a symmetry, where you know that the other uh, valley is exactly the same probability as your own, and then you just jump through. So that means you analytically know. Yeah, across the probability the of set. the full transition. Yeah. And then there's uh, cluster algorithms and there's all kinds of uh, clever uh, things where people try even, well, try to solve the sign problem, but, but even without the sign problem, where you try to know some analytic information about it, how you But without analytic answer. information, it's impossible, right? There is no No, no, but not complete analytic, you know, just, just that you can jump from one sector to another. Yeah, I know, I know. But for that, you have to know the theory good enough. Know something. <laughs> you have to be smart. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Any other questions, comments?